The prices in China are dropping, but what might sound superficially like excellent news, in reality, is the reflection of a challenging economic landscape, where international economic slowdown and inflation and the local demographic and real estate crisis come into play. Today, I will tell you about deflation, the main episodes of deflation in history, and why it is a phenomenon that causes so much concern in the Chinese economy. Deflation is the opposite term to inflation. It's a widespread fall in prices, commonly measured based on a basket of goods and services that people in a country consume. Deflation can occur for two reasons. The first arises from an increase in a country's productivity or production capacity, leading to an abundance of goods and services and insufficient demand to absorb them. This compels companies to reduce their profit margins and, consequently, their prices to achieve a balance between supply and demand. This is a scenario where deflation is positive. However, this scenario is more the exception than the rule. The second reason for deflation can be a decrease in consumption, which can stem from an economic slowdown, consumer confidence loss, excessive debt forcing individuals to prioritize payments, and particularly in recent decades, due to demographic reasons. Because most of the consumption in a population is made by people in their 20s and 30s when they become independent, buy a house, a car, and have children. As a result, aging in a population generally leads to a decline in internal consumption. When this occurs, deflation takes on a negative context as there's a risk that companies reduce their production, lay off employees, consumers are incentivized to save to gain purchasing power over time, incomes decline, people's debts become harder to pay, leading to a deflationary spiral where all of this generates a further drop in consumption and, in turn, more deflation. This has been the case in various historical episodes, one of them being the Great Depression where bank failures led to a credit decrease that reduced domestic demand while protectionist policies reduced international demand. High uncertainty caused people to decrease their consumption, and due to accumulated debt, people's and companies' incomes were used to pay off debts, leaving very little for consumption. This resulted in the bankruptcy of many companies, an increase in unemployment, and further consumption decline in the worst crisis in the history of this country. It was also the case in Japan in the 90s, when after the burst of the real estate bubble, people found themselves with debts for the next few decades, owing several times more than their properties were currently worth. So now their incomes had to be mostly allocated to paying off debts, with very little available for consumption. This, coupled with an aging population, led to a deflation episode responsible for Japan's economic stagnation for the past decades, following sustained growth after World War II. The third case, although less severe, was also related to the burst of a real estate bubble, something common in these deflationary scenarios. And it occurred in the United States after the 2008 financial crisis. Because people had bought homes during the height of the bubble and now had debt several times the value of their homes. Triggering a drastic consumption drop that led the United States to experience deflation in 2009. Amidst the worst crisis in its history since the Great Depression, these examples illustrate how a price decrease is not necessarily a positive sign and can, on the contrary, serve as an amplifier or the origin of a crisis. But is this the case for China? The producer and consumer price indexes in China, both common measures of inflation, reflected a decline in July 2023 of 4.4% and 0.3% compared to 2022. This reflects a trend in price behavior and raises the possibility that the country might be facing a deflationary episode if it fails to reverse this trend. The country, rightfully known as the world's factory, is experiencing a sharp drop in demand for its products. Internationally, there's been a 14.5% decrease in exports as of July, ironically due to inflation elsewhere in the world, which has led to interest rate hikes, reduced credit access, and less disposable income. Meanwhile, domestically, there's a weak internal demand. For now, the government has stated that there is no real issue and has attributed this demand drop to an adjustment period following the reopening. 
because China spent nearly three years in intermittent strict quarantines, and only in 2023 it rejoined the world in reopening its economy. If this is indeed the case, then internal demand should start to increase in the coming months and follow a pattern similar to the rest of the world, which saw a noticeable demand upswing after reopening. However, this might not be the case, with many signals of structural problems causing the reduced demand and price drops. When China is compared to the United States, Japan, and European countries, it's evident that domestic consumption is comparatively smaller in relation to the economy. This is due to the high emphasis investment has had on the country's economic growth. Yet, this hasn't always translated into an improved capacity for people to consume. Infrastructure has the potential to significantly enhance people's quality of life, stimulate economic growth, and contribute to a country's development. However, it has limitations, and if you build roads, trains, ports, and other infrastructures that are underutilized, you can increase your GDP size, but you might not be achieving genuine development. In recent years, there have been instances of investment in China with minimal or even negative returns, with trains and roads leading nowhere being typical examples. It's also important to remember that China is grappling with a real estate crisis, which, like the historical cases mentioned, has led many people to hold properties with debts exceeding their market value and, in many cases, properties they can't even inhabit. This has resulted in consumers having less money to spend and less confidence to do so. And as I mentioned a moment ago, although the government has dismissed this issue, it has begun to take some measures, but before telling you what they are, remember to subscribe to continue watching these videos and support the channel. China's central bank is reducing interest rates to make credit cheaper and thereby stimulate consumption. However, these measures might be ineffective due to China's demographic crisis. The rapid aging of the population and low fertility rate have caused the country's population to start declining and not have enough people in the part of its population pyramid that generates the most consumption, the young. Moreover, the youth are currently going through a tough time, with a record unemployment rate of 21.3%, according to official figures. So cheaper credit might not serve as much of a stimulus. In the worst case scenario, the country faces the risk of a deflationary spiral where the price drop encourages many people to save and thus gain purchasing power. The decrease in internal demand leads to less investment and, in some cases, increased unemployment. People's incomes fall, debts absorb an increasingly larger portion of their earnings. Consumption continues to decline, as do prices, perpetuating a vicious circle. This would translate to lower growth and force the government to intervene. However, if the problem is as structural as it seems, it's not clear that such intervention could be successful. And what do you think? Do you believe this decline in internal demand in China is temporary as the government claims, or it is a structural problem? I'd like to know your opinion. And if you want to learn more about this country's demographic crisis, I recommend you watch this video next.